Welcome to everyone. It is uh, a great pleasure to introduce this session of our Renaissance Research Seminar. Uh, we're sorry that we cannot yet welcome you in the, in the court of Vernon Square, but it's a great pleasure to see how many people can attend and participate to this um, seminar tonight. Uh, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Adriana Conchin today. Adriana started her studies at UCL and then uh, moved for, MA, for her MA at the Courtauld. Um, and she distinguished herself at the, at the Courtauld uh, in our MA by having the findings, the important findings of her of the of research she, she carried out for her dissertation, published as an important article on the, in the Burlington magazine. So you can understand how Adriana has engaged from the very last minute with in that uh, research, archival research and research in the world of 16th century art and culture. She then uh, started a PhD at the Courtauld, um, working on the, uh, do, doing research on the wedding between Joanova, Austria, and Francesco de' Medici, uh, a, a, a doctoral um, dissertation that was passed without corrections, gloriously, and is already under contract with a prominent publisher for a forthcoming book. Uh, she then, um, Adriana is a veteran at the Medici Archive project in Florence and known to many of us in London and elsewhere. She, she has conducted research for the Dresden Gemälde Gallerie and is now exhibition research assistant, which apparently means doing everything for an exhibition uh, that is due to take place at the Victoria and Albert Museum um, on Mughal art. So she is uh, expanding the scope of her research and, the, and, and her knowledge into, non -Western, into the non-Western world. Um, tonight, she will present on the topic uh, which uh, she has studied for many years, uh, conducting research in Florence, but not only, mostly and, and largely in Austria and Bohemia and Prague, and sometimes in obscure uh, archives. The topic of her paper tonight is Florence and the Holy Roman Empire in the 16th century, material culture and artistic exchange. And I'm very pleased to hand over to her to start her presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to present my work tonight to you. Um, thank you so much, Guido, for the um, kind introduction. I have recently completed my thesis with Guido, as he said, at the Courtauld, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to present some of these results here um, tonight. In 1536, the marriage of the first hereditary Duke of Florence, Alessandro de' Medici, and Margaret of Austria, daughter of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, brought the Habsburg and Medici dynasties within each other's field of vision. It was a dynastic feat for the Medici, albeit a short-lived one. After only nine months of marriage, Alessandro de' Medici was assassinated with having produced a legitimate heir abruptly severing the very first habsburg Medici marital ties. As a result, the marriage left few lasting cultural and artistic traces on the respective courts and their figureheads. Following Alessandro's assassination, Cosimo Primo de' Medici, a distant cousin of Alessandro hailing from a cadet branch of the family, came to power in 1537 as the new Duke of Florence. Cosimo's succession was endorsed by the Habsburg Emperor Charles V. However, 
The emperor denied Cosimo's much desired marriage to Alessandro's Habsburg widow, Margaret of Austria. In 1560, Cosimo's ambitions to acquire a Habsburg consort for the Meiji dynasty resurfaced, gaining momentum when he was searching for a wife for his eldest son and heir, Francesco I de' Medici. After being initially rebuffed by the Spanish branch of the Habsburg dynasty, Cosimo launched a successful bid for a Habsburg bride with Emperor Ferdinand I. Ferdinand, the head of the Austrian branch of the Habsburg family, had succeeded his brother Charles V as the new Holy Roman Emperor and had chosen the city of Vienna as his imperial capital. Ferdinand and his wife, Anna of Hungary and Bohemia, had 10 daughters, of which two remained on the marriage market. After initial Habsburg hesitation was smoothed over with a large gift of bullion, Francesco Primo de' Medici was permitted to seek the hand of Ferdinand's youngest daughter, Archduchess Johanna of Austria. Johanna had been born in Prague in 1547 the last of the imperial couple's 15 children. Her mother, Queen Anna, had died giving birth to her and she was raised at the court of Innsbruck by her elder sisters. Despite a mixed review by the Florentine ambassador at the imperial court, who deemed Johanna to be kind in appearance and of tender age, but severely lacking meat on her bones, she was an ideal candidate for aggrandizing the Medici dynasty through marriage due to her impeccable dynastic pedigree. She was the daughter of Emperor Ferdinand I, the niece of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, the sister of the subsequent Emperor Maximilian II, and the cousin of the King of Spain, Philip II, and that's to just name a few. The official wedding negotiations for Francesco's marriage to Johanna commenced in 1563, and was successfully concluded in December 1565 with laving, lavish wedding festivities in Florence that lasted for several weeks. And here you can see the ornate frontispiece of the official wedding contract, which was beautifully decorated by the Hungarian calligrapher Georg Boschke. For the Medici, who had been only recently, who had only recently overcome their banking past, the marriage was an exceptional dynastic accomplishment and significantly raised their political profile on the European stage. Moreover, the marriage had important cultural ramification for both the Medici and the Habsburg families. Not only did it signify the beginning of concrete political and family ties, but more importantly, for our purposes, it also crafted close cultural and artistic associations between these two European dynasties. These cultural connections were forged between the prominent figureheads of the two dynasties, namely the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II, his brother Archduke Ferdinand II of the Tyrol, and the Florentine Dukes and later Grand Dukes Cosimo I de Medici and his son Francesco. However, connections were also forged among a wide range of nobles from the Holy Roman Empire who played an important part in the wedding's negotiations and its festivities. By the time of Francesco and Johanna's wedding, the imperial title had long been regarded as hereditary to the Habsburg family and included the territorial holdings in Austria, including the Tyrol, the upper and lower Austrian lands, Styria, Gorizia, and Carinthia, as well as German Habsburg possessions such as the Alsace, Breisgau, and the Black Forest. Since the marriage of Emperor Ferdinand to Queen Anne of Bohemian Hungary, the kingdoms of Bohemia and Hungary, and notably the parts that had not been conquered by the Ottoman army, were under the sovereignty of the Habsburg Emperor. Habsburg courtiers who hailed from cities all over these territories were involved as envoys, brokers, secretaries, postmasters, chaperones, and informants on the occasion of the Habsburg Medici wedding. As a result, they all came into close contact with the Medici and the Florentine political and cultural orbit. The resulting web of transalpine cultural connections took many different forms. Today, I want to highlight a few of the many examples of how this union 
forged new artistic connections, initiated the transmission of artistic idioms and techniques, and created avenues for patronage between Florence and the elites of the Holy Roman Empire. I will show how the Habsburg Medici wedding provided a fertile ground for avid artistic exchanges and how it shaped the cultural landscapes of Florence and the Renaissance courts of the Holy Roman Empire in a number of idiosyncratic ways. Works of art played a central role in the asymmetrical power relations between Florence and Vienna. The Florentines quickly realized that they could not construct close ties with the imperial family based on the inferior artist, uh, aristocratic lineage. Instead, the Medici harnessed art to try to tip the balance in their favor. From the outset of the marriage negotiations, the Medici carefully and purposefully deployed their Florentine cultural and artistic capital in the wedding negotiations, utilizing elaborate gifts and displays of overt magnificence to overcome their weak dynastic credentials. In order to tip the marriage negotiations in their favor, the Medici counted, courted the emperor and his court with generous gifts of gold chains, cups, and cloth, leaving the Habsburgs and their courtiers with the tangible impressions of Medici wealth. Thereafter, however, having determined the specific cultural predilections of the imperial family through their ambassadors, the Medici mainly relied on Florence's highly prized artistic achievements to consolidate their diplomatic objective. In 1564, Emperor Ferdinand I died. Johanna's brother, Maximilian II, a voracious collector of art, ascended the imperial throne and assumed all wedding negotiations. Giulio Ricasoli, the Medici ambassador in Vienna, diligently reported on the new emperor's yearning for sculptural works, in particular bronzes and marble antiquities. According to Ricasoli, Maximilian greatly desired these, but only owned very few. They would therefore make the best gifts for the new emperor. Cosimo and Francesco followed the ambassador's advice and dispatched to Vienna three bronzes by their former court sculptor Giambologna. The Florentine chroniclers Giorgio Vasari and Vincenzo Borghini described these three bronzes as a, as a mercury in the act of flight, a narrative relief, and a further unidentified bronze figure. So far, it has not been possible to identify these works definitely. Traditionally, they have been identified as three extant Giambologna bronzes in the holdings of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Wien, namely a bronze statuette of Mercury in flight, a bas relief of an allegorical scene featuring Francesco Primo di Medici, and a bronze statuette of Venus after her bath. However, these identifications have remained contentious and may no longer be considered certain. Instead, a large-scale bronze sculpture of Mercury in flight that is located in a private collection in Rydboholm, Sweden, has convincingly been proposed as the likely candidate for Maximilian's bronze Mercury gifted on this occasion. The three bronzes arrived at the Venice court in February 1565, 15, 15, as the sources tell us, and they greatly impressed the emperor. They served as the necessary impetus to speed up the Empress' decision to grant Johanna's hand in marriage to the Meiji prince. The arrival of Giambologna's bronze sculptures as wedding gifts heralded the establishment of a canon of taste for the works of the Flemish sculptor at the imperial court. In particular, Giambologna's Mercury had a significant impact on local artistic production and patronage. In its wake, the sculptor Johann Gregor van der Schaart fashioned a bronze sculpture of the messenger god as a presentation piece to gain imperial employment in 1569. Equally, Johanna's second brother, Archduke Ferdinand II of Tyrol, after hearing about the superb bronze sculptures his brother had received from the Medici, was also keen to own a number of works by the celebrated Giambologna. He therefore sent his most trusted art agent, the Austrian nobleman Hans Albrecht von Sprinzenstein to Florence to procure several bronzes from the famed artist. 
The Habsburg patronage of Giambologna continued in the following decades. Maximilian II instilled his admiration of the Medici sculpture in his son, Emperor Rudolf II, who became one of Giambologna's most ardent admirers. On several occasions, Rudolf attempted to lure the accomplished Medician sculpture to his court in Prague. Difficult as it is to definitely identify the Giambologna sculptures once owned by Rudolf II, it can be understood from the many letters surviving in the Florentine State Archive that the emperor wrote to both Francesco and his brother and successor Ferdinando de' Medici to request and commission sculptural works by the Flemish sculptor. The surviving correspondence evinces how Rudolf II vigorously and ardently pursued Giambologna's work in both stone and bronze. Later on, Rudolf II employed at his court in Prague Giambologna's pupil Adrien de Vries, who emulated the compositions of his former master, including the figure of Mercury, for his imperial employer. Sculpture scholars such as Dorothea Dima and Dimitrios Tsikos have traced the proliferation of bronze works from Giambologna's workshops in Germany, but the marked appetite for these at the Austrian Habsburg courts has been less studied. As proprietors of burgeoning Kunstkammer collections, Johanna's father and her brothers Maximilian and Ferdinand had accumulated notable collections featuring costly treasures, works of art, rare natural objects, and exotica. However, by the 1560s, their collections were still lacking sculptural works, in particular Italian bronze works, a fact that the Medici successfully remedied with their gift of Giambologna bronzes. The choice of Giambologna as the creator of such important gifts must have been based largely on his expert abilities, but it may also have rested upon the fact that his reputation had already reached the imperial court by 1565. Knowledge of the talented sculptor in Austria can be traced back to Johannes' father, Emperor Ferdinand. He had unsuccessfully tried to convince Giambologna to come and work for the imperial family in 1562. The registers of the Tyrolean chamber record the proposition that Giambologna be summoned to Innsbruck to assist with the execution of the bronze sculptures for the funerary monument of Emperor Maximilian I in the Innsbruck court chapel. Giambologna was proposed to cast the kneeling figure of Maximilian I, who was destined, which was destined to grace the top of the cenotaph. However, the sculpture services were not made available in that instance. As Ferdinand had been unable to call Giambologna to the Austrian dominions, a set of three bronze works by the celebrated artist must have been a welcome surprise for his son, Maximilian II, three years later. For the Medici in turn, the successful deployment of Giambologna's bronze sculptures on the occasion of the Habsburg Medici wedding marked the beginning of the Medici's exploitation of his bronze works in the service of diplomacy. By the end of the 16th century, every notable European ruler had either received a bronze from Giambologna's workshop as a gift or at least requested one. Giambologna's sculpture had become an effective weapon in the Medici's diplomatic arsenal. From 1563 to 1565, the Austrian Habsburg's main seats of power, Innsbruck, Prague and the imperial capital Vienna were inundated with members of the Florentine courtly elite. The marital negotiations brought a steady stream of Tuscan envoys, ambassadors, legates, intellectuals, and special emissaries to the Habsburg courts. Many Medici courtiers made their way across the Alps. These envoys seldom arrived empty-handed, bringing precious gifts and treasures for the imperial family that revealed the full splendor of the Medici's riches. These opulent displays consisted of countless costly items and carefully selected artworks, such as the aforementioned bronze works by Giambologna, alongside portrait paintings by celebrated court artists such as Bronzino, and several prized antique sculptures and medals. 
Likewise, numerous decorated Habsburg vassals from the leading families in the empire were sent to Florence on marriage business. For example, Hans Kevenhuller, which you see here, a prominent Corinthian nobleman, diplomat and art agent, was sent to Florence as the Empress Chamberlain. There, he met with the members of the Florentine ducal family and remained in friendly contact with them for the rest of his life. Many of the relationships struck up on the occasion of the Habsburg Medici marriage endured and sparked lively cultural exchanges. Another example is the friendship forged between the imperial court antiquarian Jacopo Strada from Mantua and the Medici, Medici secretary and intellectual Jacopo Dani. Dani had met Strada during his tenure as secretary of the Florentine embassy in Vienna, which was tasked with negotiating the marriage. Even after Dani's return to Florence, he kept in touch with Strada, who became a lifelong friend. The two corresponded regularly on artistic matters and maintained, a li and maintained lively exchanges about their shared antiquarian interests. These acquaintances became further intertwined when Francesco Primo de' Medici traveled personally to Vienna in October 1565 with an illustrious retinue. Francesco's travels to the Holy Roman Empire took him to the courts of Innsbruck and Munich, the imperial capital of Vienna, where he met Emperor Maximilian II, and then on to Prague, where he met with Archduke Ferdinand II of the Tyrol. During his travels, he attended several banquets and private audiences, which provided plenty of opportunities to converse about tempering of arms, or how to successfully carve porphyry with none other than Emperor Maximilian II. In Prague, Francesco discussed hunting techniques and the latest accomplishments in arms making with Archduke Ferdinand. Whilst in Munich, he deliberated the configuration of a Kunstkammer with Duke Albert V of Bavaria. On his Austrian sojourn in 1565, Francesco also encountered key ministers and courtiers of the Habsburg Empire. One of these was the Grand Chancellor of Bohemia, Vratislav Pernstein, with whom Francesco met in Prague. A renowned and zealous art collector, Pernstein was one of the highest ranking members of the imperial court, and as Grand Chancellor of Bohemia, he was a potentially powerful ally for Francesco. Hence, when Pernstein approached the Medici for painted copies of the Medici's portrait series of illustrious men and women, the Florentine prince was eager to grant the chancellor his wish. In 1552, Francesco's father, Cosimo de' Medici, had commenced with the creation of an extensive portrait collection based upon the series of exemplary figures, i uomini famosi, established by the historian and papal physician Paolo Giovanni in Como. This portrait series is known as the Medici Serie Gioviana and is displayed today along the top floor corridor of the Fizzi Gallery. This portrait collection comprised not only portraits of famed men from biblical, mythological and historical sources, but also encompassed an extensive parade of exemplary men and the occasional woman. Bratislav Pernstein, like many other members of the Austrian, German and Bohemian nobility, had begun to assemble an impressive collection of portraits following the example set by Jovio. And the celebrated Medici cycle provided the ideal source of portraits for Pernstein's own collection. The portrait copies which Pernstein had ordered from Francesco de' Medici were installed at his Italianate style castle at Litumichel in Eastern Bohemia. Some of these copies of the Serie Giovanna still survive in the collection of Pernstein's descendants, the Lobkowitz family, such as the portrait of Michelangelo that I have illustrated here. The success of the Medici portrait copies led Pernstein to request outright the services of a Florentine portrait painter, who was to continue painting portraits at Pernstein's Bohemian residence. In 1572, the Florentine painter and later architect Costantino de Servi arrived at Litomigio Castle, where he remained for several years painting portraits, including of Pernstein and his family. Over the course of the second half of the 16th century, the Medici portrait collection became a point of reference for Austrian, Bohemian and German aristocrats, 
looking to establish their own galleries of famous men. Many other high, prof high profile Habsburg courtiers started to order portraits from the Medici, either to set up their own collections or to enrich their already existing one. Amongst these men were leading imperial courtiers such as Adam Dietrichstein, Wilhelm von Rosenberg, and Paul Sixtus I Trautzen. Direct access to the Meiji portrait collection led to a proliferation of requests for copies, and the Medici hence formulated an efficient way to meet the demand. An inventory of their portraits was sent out and the recipient simply needed to place a cross next to the desired portrait. One of these order forms can be found in the personal papers of the Austrian aristocrat Wolfgang Rumpf von Wulros, and is illustrated here. Wolfgang Rumpf, who served as Chamberlain under Maximin II, and then as Lord High Steward under Rudolf II, received over 40 portraits of famous men made for him in Florence in the 1580s. And as you can see here, black chalk crosses are carefully drawn alongside the names of the sitters Rumpf wanted for his portrait collection. Like the Bohemian and Austrian aristocrats, Johanna's brother, Archduke Ferdinand II of Tyrol, exploited the Meiji portrait collection to expand his own. Archduke Ferdinand II was one of the most consummate collectors of the House of Habsburg. After moving his court from Prague to Innsbruck in 1568, he settled at Ambras Castle, where he crafted one of the most illustrious Kunstkammer collections in early modern Europe. During Francesco's pre-wedding trip at, to the Habsburg courts to meet his new in-laws, Francesco also met with Ferdinand, then governor of Bohemia and he spent the week hunting and banqueting with his future brother-in-law. Afterwards, Ferdinand frequently called upon Francesco when it came to matters regarding art and collecting. Throughout his reign, Francesco sent medals, cameos, antiquities, bronze, portraits, grafts of rare plants and exotic animals across the Alps to Ferdinand's court in Innsbruck. Over the course of a decade starting in the 1570s, Archduke Ferdinand II also sought Francesca's assistance in assembling his own portrait collection, the so-called so Ambras portrait series. He ordered the portraits in miniature form and each was labeled at the top with gold lettering proclaiming the sitter's name. All portrait miniatures were painted on paper and laminated onto small wooden boards. In 1580, he even sent Francesco de' Medici an, a list of all the portraits he had already gathered at his residence, Ambras, and requested that the gaps be filled by the Medici. At Ferdinand's death, the Ambras portrait collection numbered 950 images, 913 of which have survived and form part of the permanent display in the Münz cabinet of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And you can see a view of that here. As such, even before the wedding was celebrated, the close bonds established during the Habsburg Medici wedding negotiations were acceler accelerated by Francesco's pre wedding visit to the Habsburg dominions. For example, as has been shown here, it led to the dissemination of the Medici portrait collection in the Habsburg dominions since members of the Habsburg family, such as Ferdinand, as well as imperial courtiers, relied on the Florentine example to embellish their own residences. On 16th December, 1565, the celebrations of the Habsburg Meiji wedding began with Johanna of Austria's ceremonial entry into the city of Florence. Her sumptuous entry was the beginning of three months of festivities, which lasted until the end of the Florentine carnival season in March, 1566. Two days after the bridal entry, the wedding ceremony took place in the Florentine cathedral, followed by a grand banquet featuring hundreds of guests. Over the following weeks, Florence hosted numerous spectacles, which included theatrical presentations, mock battles, comedies, and hunting parties. 
Cosimo and Francesco de' Medici pulled out all the stops to impress their visitors, particularly their German, Austrian and Bohemian wedding guests. It was an occasion for all of Europe to take note of the Meiji family as it attempted to showcase its full splendor and riches. Johanna of Austria arrived in Florence with a large retinue studded with an assembly of important dignitaries. Among the members of her entourage were men from the Holy Roman Empire, from the empire's most honorable dynasties, including the Hohenzollern, the Thun, Fürstenberg, the Liechtensteins, and Helfenstein and Pappenheim families. Prominent members of the retinue included the governor of Tyrol, Georg Helfenstein, German aristocrats such as Eitel Friedrich von Hohenzollern, as well as the heads of the Augsburg merchant family, the Fuckers. These men were privy to the lavish spectacles and decorative apparatus the Meiji had commissioned for the wedding celebrations. Several men in Johanna's entourage kept diaries to document the experiences at the Meiji Habsburg wedding and to relate tales of the festivities to family back home. They left vivid accounts of the pageantry that surrounded Johanna's wedding. The most comprehensive account was written by the secretary of Georg Hilfenstein, the chief steward of Johanna's retinue. This report chronicles the artistic marvels witnessed by the German wedding guests. For example, the Hilfenstein report greatly lauded the Neptune fountain in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, which was completed by the Florentine sculptor Bartolomeo Amanati just in time for the Habsburg wedding festivities. Hilfenstein's report also traced in great detail Johanna's ceremonial entry into Florence and the elaborate embellishments devised for this occasion. Conceived in tandem between the Florentine ecclesiastic and intellectual Vincenzo Borghini and the Medici's chief visual orchestrator, Giorgio Vasari, Johanna's bridal entry and its decorations demanded great intellectual, manual and artistic labor. The decorative apparatus for Johanna's entry consisted of 14 ephemeral triumphal arches and monuments, such as this one you can see here which were all erected along a processional circuit, beginning at the Porta del Prato and ending in the courtyard of the Palazzo Vecchio. Vasari and Borghini engaged the leading Florentine artists in their workshops, including such painters as Agnolo Bronzino, Alessandro Lori, and Giovanni Stradano, and sculptors including Bartolomeo Manati, Vincenzo De Rossi, and our famous Giambologna. As such, the members of Johanna's retinue were riding alongside her in the procession and passed under triumphal arches painted by Florence's leading master painters and paraded past monuments featuring, featuring prime sculptural works from Florence's best sculptors. The ceremonial entry into Florence ended in the first courtyard of the Palazzo Vecchio where the imperial guests were pleasantly surprised by a large scale fresco cycle that depicted the foremost cities of the Habsburg Empire. The extant cityscape cycle, which you can see here, was devised to delight the German and Austrian wedding guests, but was also intended as a visual device to align the Medici with the Habsburg and their dominions, not only through marriage, but also through artifice. Many of the attending nobles, after witnessing the Florentine splendor and becoming acquainted with the Meiji household, made the most out of their newfound Florentine connections. As a result, the Medici found themselves inundated by the requests from their former guests, who were now ordering, commissioning, and clamoring for a large variety of favors, mostly of cultural and artistic nature. Individual requests included hackney horses and Corsican hunting dogs, alongside marble sculptures, allegorical paintings, and luxury textiles. Several Austrian nobles also requested botanical specimens from the Medici gardens they had visited during their Florentine stay. Notably, these men also requested the loan of Florentine artists, architects, gardeners, and musicians to adorn their castles, fortify their strongholds, design their gardens, and devise musical spectacles at their respective courts. 
Overall, the members of Johanna's retinue were keen to exploit the cultural capital of Florence and were eager to model their local core culture on the Medici example they had witnessed during the Florentine wedding festivities. A specific example of this involves the members of the powerful Augsburg trading house, the Fucker. The brothers Hans, Marx, and Hieronymus Fucker, who headed the family's merchant business, traveled to Florence in November 1565 with Johanna's bridal retinue and stayed in Tuscany until January 1566. The three Fucker brothers were important patrons of art, each amassing significant collections. Their visit to Florence was seminal for their activities as patrons and collectors of art, particularly bronzes. As already postulated by Dorothea Dima and Dimitrios Tsikos, the brothers may have made contact with Giambologna during their time in Florence. During their Florentine sojourn, they may have even personally visited Giambologna's workshop. What is certain is that after their return to Augsburg, Hans and his brothers brokered the employment of a number of prestigious Giambologna students over the years with apparent ease. In 1568, for example, the brothers summoned Giambologna's pupil Carlo di Cesare del Palagio to Augsburg. This was followed by the engagement of other students of the masters, such as Hubert Gerhardt and Peter de Neue. Their two months visit to Florence must have enabled them to make it the necessary context to successfully bring these sculptures to Augsburg. I would like to bookend my presentation with another German guest at the Habsburg Meiji wedding, Count Wilhelm of Zimmern. His attendance at the Meiji Habsburg nuptials was a seminal event in his life and one that had a direct and tangible impact on his artistic and cultural patronage. Hailing from a prestigious noble family from Baden-Württemberg, Wilhelm of Zimmern was one of the closest advisors of Johann of Austria's brother, Archduke Ferdinand II. In 1565, he was appointed to a leading role in Johanna's bridal retinue, which allowed him to travel to Florence to revel in the city's sights and entertainments from December to February. During his three month stay in Florence, Wilhelm witnessed the full range of events staged for the splendid wedding festivities. He attended banquets in the Salone dei Cinquecento in the Palazzo Vecchio and visited the newly built Corridorio Vasariano. He was particularly impressed by the beautifully laid out Boboli Gardens at the Palazzo Pitti. He left Florence in 1566, deeply enthralled by the splendor he experienced in the city on the Arno. Shortly after Wilhelm's return from Florence, his father died and he became the head of the House of Zimmern, taking control of the court of Meskirch. Part of Baden-Württemberg today, Meskirch was a small lordship located only a few miles north of the Lake of Constance, and it had served as the residence of the Counts of Zimmern since the 14th century. Wilhelm's father, Count Froben Christoph of Zimmern, was a hugely accomplished and influential man. Anyone studying 16th century German philology or early modern Kunst and Wunderkammern would have known him as the author of the Zimmern Chronicle. A family chronicle recounting the history and lineage of the noble family of Zimmern that was written between 1564 and 1566. The Zimmern Chronicle is a key source of historic information about the Renaissance nobility in Southern Germany as it elucidates their culture and values. Moreover, the term Kunst und Wunderkammer was, as far as we know, first employed by Count Froben in his Zimmern Chronicle. Interestingly, Count Froben used this term to describe the collection of rarities and works of art that his uncle, Wilhelm Werner, had showcased to Johann of Austria's father, Emperor Ferdinand I, during the 1541 Imperial Diet in Speyer. Count Wilhelm of Zimmern inherited his great uncle's famed Kunstkammer along with his father's castle in Meskirch. Building upon the significant cultural legacy of his father and his great uncle, Wilhelm was eager to replicate the splendor he witnessed in Florence in his little lordship of Meskirch. During his time in Florence, Wilhelm had quickly struck up warm relations with Francesco de' Medici, 
and later turned to his new Florentine acquaintance to request the services of a Florentine sculptor, a gardener and an architect. Impressed by the exquisite music he had heard during the Florentine festivities, he also arranged for a local Swabian musician, Georg Busenhardt, to study music in Florence for several years and to assemble a chamber orchestra in Mesche upon his return. The Count of Zimmern's request was generously granted by Francesco de' Medici, who was eager to please one of Archduke Ferdinand II of Tyrol's most trusted advisors, an esteemed Habsburg vassal. Francesco dispatched the Florentine sculptor Raffaello Peri, together with a Medici gardener, to the court of Meschier. The chosen gardener was a certain Lorenzo di Baldassari Romelino, nicknamed Scaramuccia. He was an apprentice of the head gardener of Boboli, and he was tasked with replicating the botanical splendors of Florence in Zimmer's bucolic residence in Mesche. Raffaello Peri, meanwhile, was a pupil and collaborator of the well-known Florentine sculptor Vincenzo de Rossi. Peri was a member of Florence Accademia del Disegno and together with de Rossi worked on the decorative apparatus for Johanna and Francesco's wedding in 1565. He was commissioned for sculptural work on a triumphal arch erected on the Canto dei Carnasecchi as part of the bride ceremonial entry into Florence. Raffaello Peri is also the author and caster of an impressive monumental bronze sculpture on display at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. This larger than life size bronze group depicts Pluto abducting Persephone, the daughter of Ceres, and most likely was made in 1566 after Peri's work on the Habsburg Meiji wedding decorations. Peri was clearly a capable sculptor who was well versed in the complex art of casting large scale bronze works. In Meskir, Raffaello Peri was charged with creating a series of monumental sculptures and relief stucco work to decorate the Great Hall of Meskir Castle. Italian stucco work was particularly sought after by German rulers as evinced by a contemporaneous letter written by the Duke, Sa the Duke of Saxony, August the first of Wettin, who unsuccessfully petitioned Francesco de' Medici to divulge his recipe for making stucco. We do not know further specifics about Perry's project. And as you can see here, aside from the coffered wooden ceiling, no original decorations from the 16th century survive in the Great Hall today. One may speculate that Simon envisioned a grand hall featuring a coffered wooden ceiling, gilded stucco work, and large scale sculptures lining the walls. Despite Wilhelm of Simon's success in retaining Florentine artists at his court, Raffaello Peri's endeavors at Meskirch did not turn out to be as triumphant as Wilhelm had hoped. His employment of the Boboli gardener Scaramuccia also did not result in much success. A lengthy letter was written by the Count of Zimmern to Francesco de' Medici to recount his travails with these two Florentines. Unhappy with their employment conditions and the local weather in particular, Peri conspired with his compatriot gardener to return to Florence. The Count of Zimmern did not want to let his precious artisan go. However, the two Florentines concocted a plan to escape back home, which they successfully executed in 1579. Furious and angered by the fugitive artists, the Count of Zimmern wrote a detailed complaint to Francesco, demanding their immediate return. Francesco did not manage to broker this request. Instead, he placated the irritated German count by finding swift replacements for the runaways. Francesco subsequently sent the Florentine architect and sculptor Giovanni Gargiolli to Meschir, as well as a new Medici gardener. The second group of artists arrived in Meschir in 1579, and they were put to work with great success. In particular, Giovanni Gargiolli proved to be a capable sculptor and architect. The Count of Zimmern was greatly satisfied with his services and recommended Gargiolli 
his abilities to none other than the Holy Roman Emperor himself. In 1583, Gargioli entered, entered the services of Emperor Rudolf II in Prague as his imperial architect. Working for the Count of Zimmern, Gargioli had made a name for himself in the German-speaking world, and accordingly, Emperor Rudolf II poached him to oversee the design and construction of a new wing at Prague Castle. Thus, through the new connections forged on the occasion of the Habsburg Meiji wedding, the Count of Zimmern was able to import several Tuscan artists to his small Swabian lordship. However, these new connections and artistic ties were not frictionless, and as we have seen, they were not always marked by success. Despite the presence of Florentine artists in his service, the Count of Zimmer continued throughout his life to source artworks and luxury goods from Florence for his residence. He ordered majolica and sumptuous Florentine textiles and requested botanical specimens from Francesco for his gardens. He often made use of the Austrian nobleman Hans Albrecht of Sprinzenstein, whom he had also met at the wedding festivities in Florence, where Hans had served as Johanna of Austria's cupbearer. Unfortunately, today, nothing remains of either Wilhelm of Zimmern's art collection or Peri's and Gargioli's sculpture and architectural works. The splendid Renaissance gardens at Mesquite Castle have likewise vanished. Wilhelm of Zimmern died without heirs in 1594, leaving his residence and its contents to be divided up amongst his brothers-in-law. Nevertheless, this episode remains a remarkable, though short-lived, example of the cultural relations sparked by the union of Johanna of Austria and Francesco Primo de' Medici. To conclude, as I have tried to highlight today, the marriage of Johanna and Francesco in 1565 resulted in a manifold of cultural interconnections between Florence and the ruling elite of the Holy Roman Empire. It not only brought Johanna's family members, such as Emperor Maximilian and Archduke Ferdinand II, into close contact with the Florentine ruling family, but also to several leading Habsburg courtiers. This cultural relationship between the dynasties only became closer with the subsequent string of Habsburg Meiji marriage alliances, which began in 1608 when Grand Duke Cosimo II de Medici wed Maria Magdalena of Austria who succeeded her aunt Johanna to the Tuscan Grand Ducal throne. As a result, these sovereigns and their courts continued to foster an animated and sustained artistic and cultural relationship over the course of the following decades and all the way into the early 18th century. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adriana. That was a, a wonderful paper, very clear and very so rich. And I think it gave us uh, a, a good glimpse of the vast knowledge you have accumulated <laughs> on the subject and and the, the really uh, incredible amount of detail that you have been able to draw from your research, uh, really opening up uh, a, a new world uh, of exchanges between a uh, very familiar Italian <laughs> Uh, a very familiar Italian context and, and much less um, explored areas of patronage and artistic production. Thank you very much. Um, there are so I would open it up to uh, questions which are uh, coming in through the chat. I would invite everyone who has a question to um to uh, to to put it in the chat and i'll try to keep up with the with the flow uh the first um, um question that i find here has to do with the language in which these people corresponded and it is a very interesting question does what, what is the language um of the exchanges and does uh something get lost in translation so to speak one has to speak many languages studying the, the Habsburg <laughs> Empire. Um, I mean, the Florentines would write in Italian to the Habsburgs and the Habsburgs in turn would correspond in Latin. 
So the majority of the letters are either in Latin or Italian, but you do find the occasional German letter in the Florentine archives and the Medici had to kind of scramble to find someone to translate these letters for them. As it was not very easy, I mean, to this day, it's not very easy to decipher 16th century German script. So they did correspond in a multitude of languages. So you do also have some of the Austrian Habsburg emperors write in Spanish occasionally. <laughs> right, talking of Spain, as someone is asking about Sophonis Banguissola, Sophonis Banguissola went actually to Spain, became court, a painter at the court of Philip II, so not in Austria, as well, unfortunately, but in the same period. I mean, Emperor I'm sure Adriana has something <laughs> about Sophonis yeah. as well. I, yeah, I visited her house in Cremona, so I feel very, very familiar and with Sophonis <laughs> Um, the Austrian Habsburgs, unfortunately, were not able to retain the services of Sophonis Bangusola, even though they very much would have liked to. They tried to, especially Emperor Maximin II, tried to hire um, Tintoretto's daughter as to kind of rival his cousin Philip II, but also having a female court painter. But this never actually materialized. But That's very, very interesting. <laughs> Another question uh, which I see, it's about the, the wedding uh, kind of ephemeral uh, constructions, triumph arches. Was, was this uh, everything dismantled or the painting? Yes. So the person, sorry, I don't know the name, Catherine, I suppose, is asking whether everything was sold uh, or was when dismantled, what happened to the, so the anything can be traced? So most of the decoration were ephemeral and they were taken down after the festivities and they can no longer be traced. We don't know what happened to them. The only thing that we have is the first courtyard that was refurbished on occasion of the wedding where you have the Habsburg cityscape, the frescoes, and the columns are beautifully decorated as well with gold leaf. And you also have Amanati's um, Neptune fountain. So these two elements are the only permanent elements that remain from the ceremonial entry. The other parts we don't know what happened to them most of them were made of materials that were not long lasting so after the wedding they would have been discarded unfortunately we don't we only have a few drawings by Vincenzo Borghini that kind of allow us to understand how these ephemeral triumphal arches would have looked like I mean if someone finds anything <laughs> I'll be happy <laughs> to know about it but so far I haven't been able to trace any of the the monuments erected for the Trump entry of Johanna. Or any the next, next question is about horses. Were they hackney horses? Were yes. they exported exactly. from, so they export they... from England to Florence and then the Meiji themselves would interbreed these horses. And mm. Cosimo at one point had developed his own breed, but I'm not the specialist <laughs> in that field. <laughs> So uh, uh, the next question from Emma is about, um, apart from the gardener, are, were artists happy at the imperial courts and, and, the, <laughs> and, their, and their... In general, they weren't very happy and <laughs> it wasn't unusual for them to not enjoy the working conditions in the Holy Roman Empire. And especially as mentioned by the um, sculptor and the gardener, the, um, the conditions and especially the temporal conditions, the weather really displeased them. They really weren't happy with the cold winters they had to endure north of the Alps. They weren't very much used to it. And you also have the, the Florentine painter and later famous architect Constantino de Servi when he worked in Bohemia. He, after a few years, he very much wanted to return home to Florence and he didn't enjoy his stay in Bohemia either. So in general, these experiences weren't very positive ones. Uh, then we have some praise from some of the member of the public and someone is um, <laughs> rising to read one of your, uh, your, your articles. <laughs> 
which I won't I mention. It's very easy to, to find. It will be shortly published uh, by Bloomsbury and available in paperback. Yes. Congratulations. Lots of thank you. Okay. Superb and fascinating <laughs> paper, fabulous talk. Um, to what extent uh, is this uh, political shift? A, political, B, shared interest, and C, one upmanship on the part of Florence. To, uh, what, this? to what extent is this? Oh, definitely. The Medici definitely wanted to demonstrate the cultural prowess to the Habsburgs. I think this was really part, really important as part of the rapport for the Medici to really showcase their cultural heritage and for the... They couldn't really show off with it, you know, aristocratic credentials or their dynastic credentials. So really, this is something that I also very much argue in my work is they quickly realized that the way they could up the Habsburgs was to really demonstrate the artistic and cultural capital they had. And that translated also in political discourse. Um, there, there is a long uh, question about hermitism and Trismegistus, which I think um, maybe it's not the moment since we have only 10 minutes to, uh, but hopefully we will save this question and hopefully you can answer um, the, the, the member of the-, the of Yeah, I'm happy. This is a great question, but I think that I don't think I can answer it Right it, now, it, it's really probably the subject to... of a of a <laughs> of a of a complex and oh, long discussion. I'm really happy to answer that question. Uh, so it will be saved and and yes. answered I'll separately. I make sure. Um, where I'm did all the wedding? From... This is very interesting. Where did all the wedding guests stay? Given that Florence is a small city, this is from Elizabeth. Thank you for this question. This is a really wonderful question. And um, I did spend some time trying to find this out. So the main members of the retinue actually stayed in the Palazzo Vecchio. I haven't really figured out exactly where the Palazzo Vecchio, but kind of the five leading members stayed with Johanna of Austria in the Palazzo Vecchio, whereas the low ranking members were accommodated in a variety of palaces. Some stayed with Cosimo Bartoli, some stayed with Florentine secretaries like Jacopo Dani, and some even stayed at the house of the Florentine ambassador in Vienna, Giulio Ricasoli. So they were kind of divided up amongst various noblemen's houses throughout Florence. And then obviously the lowest of the lowest of the foot folks and the stable boys would stay in local taverns. That's very interesting, uh, broad questions. Maybe hopefully you can answer quickly. Why didn't the Habsburg connect directly to the Netherlandish artistic world? That's a good question. I mean, yeah. on occasion of the Habsburg Meiji wedding, the interesting thing of the Habsburg connecting to Florence was they had such easy access and it came for free. They didn't have to make much effort. They had to just get in touch with the Medici and demand the free services of their artists. So, of course, they chose to reach out to Florence when it was free of charge to obtain some of these artists. But they equally did reach out to the Netherlands to the Netherlands to, to hire various artists. For example, this Johan Greok van der Schaat, he was a Netherlandish artist who came to Vienna. And I mean, Adrien de Vries originally was from the Netherlands, but came to Prague via Florence. But absolutely, they, they did employ artists directly from the Netherlands. Obviously, then later on in the 70s, when you have um, the trouble starting in the Netherlands, thanks to the Duke of Alba, the situation becomes a little bit more problematic. But yeah, no, this absolutely did take place. But the Habsburg were always financially strained. So whenever they could get yes. access of free labor, they would happily make the most of it. Yes, this is a point that we discussed many times in, uh, during the, the your development of your research and it, it was cheap <laughs> Italian Italian art in, in a way in this context. Um, another question from Sophie is maybe this what led the British uh, to to Italy to collect in the 17th century. Did you see any connection between this drive towards Florence and the subsequent uh, income incoming 
uh, British collectors? I don't know what I, I was aware of is how much Cosimo de Medici and Francesco were already part of fabricating the myth of Florence as the epicenter or cultural epicenter of Italy. It is really interesting how they almost themselves conceived as Florence as the cradle of the Renaissance and propagated Florence as such, which then obviously in the 17th and 18th century is what brings a lot of British travelers to Florence. And a pertinent example is that one of Johanna's brothers comes and visits Florence in 1569 and her third brother is called Charles II of in Austria. And the Medici take him to the old sacristy. That's the first thing they do. They take him to the old sacristy and then to the new sacristy in San Lorenzo to show him the importance of Florentines, Florentine art, which I thought was incredibly interesting that they were already aware of the, the, the importance of their Renaissance monuments. The, the, the Vasari lives themselves in 1568 yeah. contributed to this. Yeah, probably, absolutely. Uh, uh, then more praise, it will be available uh, to view on the YouTube channel. Uh, someone is asking whether or not it, it will. The Medici absorb it changes. Adriana, as I highlighted, tend to be one directional with Florence being perceived as a shining artistic center that radiates far beyond its confines. Was there also an appreciation for arts and culture from Austria in Florentine grand ducal circles? Thank you, Alexander, for this question. This is a really, really wonderful question. Obviously, I would have loved to elaborate on, on the flip side of the coin in the sense that how the Florentines perceive that the arts and culture of the Austrian Habsburgs what is fascinating is that what interests especially the Medici were arms and armor and gunmen, how gunsmith created armor and the Medici in particularly were interested in Tyrolean arms maker like the famous Georg Seisenhofer. Georg Seisenhofer was the imperial armorer. He created the most brilliant suit of armors for Charles V, Ferdinand I of Austria. And Francesco de Medici in particular was an ardent fan of his work. And actually, when he visited Innsbruck, commissioned a suit of armor from this Georg Seisenhofer, who was one of the most celebrated arms makers. So the appreciation, especially for suits of armor, was, was profound from the side of the Medici. More praise and congratulations <laughs> from Scott. And Marco Manzi asks wh whether the, the cities were uh, either uh, studied from life or after prints. And there is the, this is what the Adriana's article on the Burlington Magazine uh, discusses uh, at great length. And yeah. much was uh, based on studies from life. Yes, I absolutely. Know, I know very well why Marco is interested in that. Yes. <laughs> and Marco. the other opportunities to discuss this. I'm with happy everybody. to talk about this in detail. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering uh, if, uh, Barbara is asking, I'm wondering if there was any artist in Joanna's retinue when she arrived in Florence, especially any portraitist. Unfortunately, there wasn't. And I looked at this very carefully. And we, we have the lists of gentlemen that accompanied her, very, very detailed accounts of who actually traveled with her and what position they occupied within her retinue. But actually there wasn't a portrait artist that traveled with her also because the Habsburg, the Austrian Habsburg at that mo moment didn't have many portrait artists and they couldn't really afford to let go of one of their own. But what did take place is that shortly before Johanna's departure, Francesco Terzio, which you know Barbara very well, um, he created a full length portrait of Johanna in her most splendid gown and the Medici jewels, the bridal jewels, the Medici had gifted her before the wedding. So she was portrayed, I think it was like two weeks before her departure for Florence to kind of um, illustrate that momentous and or mark this very momentous occasion. Uh, thank you. The next question was, uh, was Giorgio Vasari involved in the wedding celebrations? Indeed. Yes, very much so. He was absolutely crucial in all aspects of the wedding preparations. Uh, Giorgio Vasari and Vincenzo Borghini were responsible for 
um, coming up with the entire theme of the wedding, the bridal entry, the decorations done in the Palazzo Vecchio. Giorgio Vasari was absolutely crucial. I mean, he was the main visual orchestrator of the Medici at the time, and he really was involved in every single aspect of the festivities. And he was also involved in, with negotiations and exchanges with the Austrian Habsburgs. He very much takes a lead on choosing what paintings to be gifted to the emperor and what type of art should be selected as a diplomatic gift. So yeah, he was absolutely crucial. Um, thank you. Um, this is from Paula Anderson asking, while the Habsburg desired works of art from the Medici court, were there forms of art, porcelain, jewelry, whatever, that the Medici were impressed by? So apart from suits of armor, the Medici were greatly impressed by German jewelry, especially uh, jewelry made in Augsburg, as well as goldsmith wares produced in cent goldsmithing centers like Nuremberg and Augsburg. So they very much um, ordered as well um, sets of jewelry made by Augsburg goldsmith. So not really porcelain, but jewelry definitely. Jewelry is important part of the negotiations and the major were greatly impressed by the type of jewelry Johanna brought with her, which was mainly Augsburg made. Thank you. More praise from the public, uh, including uh, an appreciation of the fact that looking at the Medici from a different perspective brings new life into the sub a very well trodden subject. And then a question from Peter, why did it take so long for the negotiations to take, uh, to, to achieve the actual wedding? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, two main factors was that actually Johanna had other suitors. I didn't mention this, but Francesco de Minci wasn't the only one who was trying to obtain her hand in marriage. So there were other people simultaneously pursuing her hand in marriage, which kept delaying the Medici's efforts. One of them was um, the ruler of Transylvania called John Sapolia, and um, he was a rivaling candidate. And on the other hand, the death of Johanna's father, Emperor Ferdinand I in 1564, just before the BG had almost managed to get him to sign the contract, again delayed the entire negotiations because the moment a new emperor, her brother Maximilian II, ascended to the throne, the Beatty almost had to restart their entire um, political maneuvering. Thank you. Um, I see we have the, the number of questions keep growing. We'll, we'll <laughs> go on for five to maximum 10 more minutes. Um, this was a political, a princely political marriage. Did any of the gifts fail? Did any of the gifts were not <laughs> failed to amuse or please? During the wedding negotiations, no. I, I think they were extremely careful in selecting what they gifted and they amassed a huge amount of intel before gifting anything. So that's really interesting, the fact that they really informed themselves extremely well through the ambassadorial network, what they should gift to whom. But then after the wedding, certainly the Medici continued sending gifts and some of them weren't as appreciated as they hoped for. Um, especially some of the paintings they sent did not meet the taste of the Habsburg family. And some of the portraits they sent of themselves, the uh, portraits sent by Cosimo de' Medici were mistaken for portraits by Francesco de' Medici. And they felt they were being dishonest because the portrait made the Duke of Florence Cosimo look young, whereas at that point he was in his <laughs> 50s. So they were very much let down by <laughs> how Florentine portraiture did not accurately represent its rulers. I think if you can wait for Adriana's book, you'll find <laughs> lots and lots, lots and lots of uh, interesting stories about the gifts and the complex uh, reactions to, to such gifts, which were prepared by uh, long uh, inquiries about the tastes of the recipients. 
Okay, how far geographically would you say the Medjugorje pieces reach directly? Uh, in terms of where they were sent throughout the empire, in terms of geography? I, I think so, I probably. I mean, they, you know, Medjugorje gifts, they reached in the Tyrol, they reached Salzburg, to Vienna, to Lower Austria, the court of Graz, all the way to Bohemia with Prague and, you know, small residences like Litomizhl. So really, if you want to, I've, I've once created a map that like shows you the, the entire kind of web of, you know, how all these gifts traveled and who they reached. So it really is a kind of tight web of cultural exchange that kind of spans across modern day Austria, Czech Republic, Northern Italy, Germany. If you could spell the title of your book for Romy, she's ready to to, to pre-order it. I don't, it doesn't have a definite title yet, but it's something along the lines of the Habsburg <laughs> Meiji wedding of 1565. Here is a question about uh, mm. more, more um, uh, um, specific about the presence of Spanish Habsburg branch in the ceremony. Was there mm -hmm. any friction here? Since, Thank you uh, so much, Isabel, for your question. Um, this is from Isabel Kent. Yes. Actually, none of the Spanish Habsburg members attended the festivities. Philip II just sent his warmest regards. And actually, there wasn't any friction. Philip II himself actually quite avidly supported this union. He didn't himself want to give one of his daughters to the Medici because his daughters for him were too precious of kind of were too precious to be married off of someone to someone as unfortunately lowly as the Medici. But he very much supported the union because he was interested in tying the Medici more closely within his political sphere. So wow. actually there was no friction. Philip stood behind that union and supported it and continued to support it while it lasted, even in the face of Francesco de Medici's um, let's say, sexual exploits with his Venetian mistress, Bianca Capello. Philip II often intervened and tried to bring Johanna and Francesco back together. Then there's a question from Vasari that has been already answered mm -hmm. with Saluti dal Map, this Medici archive project. And um, were there English there? No, as, well, as far as I know, I don't think any English Noblemen attended the wedding. I'm not sure, but I so far have not come across any Englishmen attending the wedding. I mean, interestingly enough, at the same time as Johann of Austria's wedding was negotiated at the Imperial Court, a wedding between Queen Elizabeth of England was negotiated with Charles II of Inner Austria, Johanna's brother. So Johanna's brother, Charles, was in negotiation with the Queen of England about them getting married. But obviously, as we know, these negotiations didn't come to fruition, but that's quite interesting. So you had at the same time, the Florentine ambassador at the Viennese court was petitioning the emperor for Johanna's hand in marriage. You have the English ambassador petitioning for the you know, hand in marriage of Charles II of in Austria, the Queen Elizabeth I. <laughs> Which is quite a thing about it. Yeah, this is a this is a uh, sorry. Yeah. This is a big one on our Italian artists in Prague that perhaps deserves a different kind of response to long. I presume which Italian artists stayed in pra in Prague for Rudolf the Second. I think you this you can perhaps send a, a direct answer. It seems to. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm happy to do so. I also uh, did the Medici become bankers to the uh, to the Habsburg, uh, as well as uh, building diplomatic relations. I, I don't think by that time the Medici did not, and they were not bankers anymore. They were hereditary dukes, and they did not make their money through banking anymore. So their banking passed at this point. So by the middle of the 16th century, was well behind them. Was well. Uh, so actually the Fuka were the bankers of the Habsburg the Fuka, yeah. at the time. So the Fuka family um, 
giving out large loans to both the Meiji and the Habsburgs at that point. So it'd be the focus by then. Uh, someone is asking uh, whether there were triangular artistic exchanges uh, with the Habsburg in Spain. Absolutely, absolutely. Many, many, really, it's really interesting to then see out of that wedding how many kind of these triangular exchanges actually emerge. And um, I briefly mentioned this Austrian nobleman called Hans Kievenhuller, with, who came to Florence, met the Medici in Florence and struck up a very close relationship with them and then went on to Spain to become the imperial ambassador to Spain. And he very much is a figurehead between Austria Florence and Spain and facilitated a lot of these exchanges and a book will be published soon by Annemarie Jordenkschwend on Hans Kevenhuller, which really traces his activities in great detail so there's lots of information or will be lots of information in this book of an art agent that really was active between Austria Spain and Florence. The next question will be of general interest uh, to, to all the audience. Was the marriage arrangement successful for jo Joanna? <laughs> That's probably the most loaded question because I, I, I purposefully left that out. That, I mean, in historiography, Johanna and Francesco's marriage would be deemed, has been deemed an absolute disaster. But me studying their marriage actually, I mean, it, a much more nuanced picture emerges when you, when you study their union. I mean, there was a constant problem of Francesco de' Medici um, cheating on Johanna with his Venetian mistress, Bianca Capello. But their relationship was much more complicated. The issue for a long time in their marriage was due to the fact that Johanna of Austria did not give birth to a male heir and only very late did so in 1573. So there, there was a strained relationship relationship between Johanna and Francesca due to the fact that she was simply not able to deliver a male heir. Um, thank you, Adriana. But I think since we have uh, 51 more new messages, I would <laughs> like to, um, you, you will go through with your, when you have time, you go through the questions and hopefully can reply uh, to give your responses to at least some of the questions that are, 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 are being asked. And, and they're still growing, the number is still growing, so I, I can't keep up. There's one that I find um, mm -hmm. very uh, interesting and which I would like to add a, a question of mine to is, is mm -hmm. closely related. Many star patronage included artists whose works were uh, would be viewed as anti-religious or frivolous. Was What was the only empire stand on that. And I would add to this, was, was there any impact between all these German courts, uh, some of which had Protestant leanings or definitely Protestant orientations and the Medician family? Was, was that in the way of their relationship? Do you feel that religious confession had any part to play in this? No. But also, of course, going back to what is said, where the works seen as anti-religious. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start with the first one. Not at all. Uh, um, and the, the most wonderful example of that is the fact that the Medici struck an extremely close relationship with the court of Saxony. The Dukes of Saxony became extremely intertwined with the court of Florence and I mean that close relationship transgressed any um, religious borders and the Dukes of Saxony were probably the most famous Protestant rulers of the Holy Roman Empire and they still entertained a very close relationship with the Medici and the Medici so, saw absolutely no problem of being politically close and allied to the Dukes of Saxony so no um, in terms of any of the art as anti-religious, actually, I think it's important to know that the, especially Habsburg and the Austrian Habsburg Emperor um, greatly admired Promiscuous art at that moment. And I mean, they were staunch defenders of the Catholic faith, the Holy Roman Emperor himself being one half of God's representative on earth. 
but especially Emperor Maximilian II and Rudolf II were extremely famous for their taste in um, Cilicia's art works. I mean, especially Emperor Rudolf II, but also Maximilian II. And the Medici knew this very well, that he had a very promiscuous taste and they sent him many paintings of nude women. And there's all the wonderful letters where the Medici ambassador writes home to the, in Vienna, writes home to the Medici in Florence saying, as you well know, the emperor loves painted portraits of women, preferably of them being nude. So I don't think any of the artworks were seen as anti-religious or uncouth. Well, the, the re religion didn't play a part in this, these exchanges, it seems. Yeah. Um, there's many more, and one very interesting, how, how much has been dispersed and lost later during the Thirty Years' War? I mean, that's a really important aspect of this type of research is the fact that the Habsburg collections have been dispersed and very little remains, and it's quite tricky to track down the different objects. So once you have tracked their journey from Florence to Vienna, or Prague or Innsbruck, it becomes very tricky to trace their whereabouts nowadays. Um, but you've shown things in Sweden. Yes, absolutely. So most of the Viennese collection went to Prague when Rudolf II moved his residence to Prague. And then during the Thirty Year War, the Swedish army looted the Prague Castle collections, which was the main, which were the, where the main Habsburg collections were kept. And they ended up in Sweden. And then from Sweden, they ended up wherever. So yeah. Lots of more praise for you, Adriana. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to get from Innsbruck to Florence? That's a really wonderful question because I actually, <laughs> I spend a good amount of time trying to figure this out and trying to trace every single step of the retinue of how long they traveled, where they traveled to. So they went from Innsbruck and to Stelzing Vipiteno, crossed the Brennero, went down to Verona. And then um, in, they actually went through the Venetian um, territories to Mantova, and it took them a week to get to Verona. It took them a week to then get to Bologna. And then they, 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 their stopovers become more frequent as they enter Florentine territory. So it took them another week to arrive at Poggio Cagliano, which was their last stop before they made the ceremonial entry into Florence in, on the 18th of, on the 16th of December. So it took them three weeks overall. That's including many layovers and stops in various cities where they were um, welcomed by various rulers. I think it'd be quick as if you're traveling on horse, some of the envoys and ambassadors could do Innsbruck Florence in like six days, but they were on, on horses and traveling quite quickly. Sophie suggests this will make for a lovely film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, Quite an eventful one, yeah. I, I think I would uh, wrap it up here. I'm sorry, I've got 54 new messages now, and they don't seem to, de <laughs> to, to get lower the number. So, um, um, or so at least this is what I read here. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to thank you, Adriana, really for, for a wonderful paper that our audience seems to have loved uh, enormously and we've all enjoyed it uh, together with you. Um, thanks a lot. And thank you also for answering so many disparate questions. And um, the, the, as I said, the, the, this a seminar will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, we will save all the questions and I'm sure Adriana will go through them and do her best to, an, uh, to answer um, those that she can answer. Absolutely. So, Thank you very much again. Uh, it was a so pleasure to, to hear again about all this <laughs> wonderful material. And I would uh, uh, welcome you at the next seminar as part of the audience. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Have a good you. evening, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.